So, so solving the heat shield problem is, I think, probably the single biggest remaining challenge for Starship. With over 20 years in rocketry, SpaceX knows better than anyone how critical the heat shield system is to Starship's survival during re-entry. Yet, right before Flight 10, the company made a move no one expected. They removed hundreds of Ship 37's heat shield tiles from both the hull and all four flaps. At first glance, this seems like a guaranteed recipe for disaster. If the ship flew in that condition, it would almost certainly be incinerated before splashdown. But, as it turns out, this was actually a genius move by Elon Musk, aimed at testing and upgrading the vehicle for future flights. So, what exactly SpaceX is really aiming for? Let's find out on today's episode of Alpha Tech. You might already know that those $30 hexagonal ceramic tiles on Starship are actually extremely vulnerable to physical impact. As proof, you can see this worker easily drilling small holes into them and prying the tiles off with nothing more than a small knife. But don't get it wrong, these tiles are made of porous, lightweight silica fibers with a very low density of about 0.2 to 0.3 grams per cubic centimeter, which makes them incredibly effective at insulating against temperatures of up to 1,600 degrees Celsius. Furthermore, their boron carbide coating reflects and radiates heat away, reducing the amount that penetrates the spacecraft. These are an upgraded version of the ceramic tiles once used on NASA's now-retired space shuttle. If a few tiles were to come off while the spacecraft is blazing through the atmosphere at speeds of up to 28,000 kilometers per hour, re-entry could still be safe thanks to the redundant design. Over 18,000 tiles cover Starship's surface, allowing the surrounding ones to partially compensate for the gap. The stainless steel skin underneath can withstand much higher temperatures than the aluminum used on the shuttle, adding another layer of protection to prevent serious damage. On top of that, Starship's re-entry angle is carefully calculated so that the hot plasma flows diagonally across the surface, minimizing direct impact on exposed spots and spreading the heat rather than concentrating it in one area. Still, losing too many tiles in the same region could spell serious trouble. Then, just yesterday, when Ship 37 was rolled out to Pad 1 for its third static fire test, observers noticed something shocking. Hundreds of heat shield tiles had been removed right before the Starship Flight 10 mission. And this is no ordinary flight. It's a crucial test meant to prove that all of SpaceX's recent fixes actually work, from solving vibration and pressure loss issues to sealing leaks, resolving the PEZ door malfunction, deploying the dummy Starlink, and most importantly, pulling off a controlled splashdown in the ocean. So why would SpaceX take such a risky move? Perhaps there's a bigger purpose behind it. To get to the bottom of this, let's hear it straight from Elon Musk. I think probably the single biggest remaining challenge for Starship. And then, of course, getting the upper stage or the ship to land and also get caught by the, the giant metal chopsticks. Let me clarify. After all the Starship explosions we just talked about, Elon is now extremely eager for Starship to survive in space and successfully complete its mission. Only then would a safe splashdown or a landing on Mechazilla be meaningful. In fact, Elon has said that landing on Mechazilla won't happen until next year. For now, the focus is on getting Starship to the ideal altitude to deploy Starlink satellites, somewhere between 230 kilometers and 410 kilometers, depending on the mission. You see, Starship wasn't just built for space travel. It's also designed to eventually replace Falcon 9 for satellite launches. The problem? No flight so far has reached that ideal altitude. Only Starship Flight 9 made it to 196 kilometers, but pressure issues caused it to shake, spin, and lose control. Even though it didn't hit the target altitude, the Pez door did open, but engine issues meant only a third of them opened, so Starlink deployment failed. This was just a test flight, of course. On a real mission, Starship would need to reach at least 210 kilometers to deploy Starlink properly. Once deployed, the satellites use ion engines, usually running on Krypton, to adjust their orbits, eventually reaching operational altitudes around 550 kilometers, about 340 miles. Some satellites operate slightly lower or higher, like 540 kilometers or 570 kilometers, depending on the satellite cluster. Now, you might be wondering about those missing ceramic tiles. Taking some of them off doesn't stop Starship from reaching its target altitude, which, after all, is still the ship's main mission. What it does do is let SpaceX push Ship 37 to its limits and see if it can survive up there. 
Remember, these ships eventually need to be tough enough to drift hundreds of thousands or even millions of kilometers to the moon or Mars. If the ship gets destroyed just because a few heat shield tiles are missing, that's a sign it still isn't safe enough to carry cargo, let alone astronauts. Of course, those tiles aren't actually needed while it's climbing up through the atmosphere. That's why they stripped hundreds of heat shield tiles to gather real test data. This isn't the first time they've done it on previous flights to watch how the stainless steel hull reacts to extreme heat without full protection. These tests show how durable the steel is in space and during re-entry, how well the white secondary ablative layer under the tiles works when some tiles are missing, and where weak spots might be, like around the flap hinges where plasma could sneak in. From there, engineers can reinforce the ship, thicker steel, better welds, making it stronger for future flights. Previous test flights exploded before they could get any useful data, so doing it again now? Totally normal. It doesn't stop there. After this third static fire, SpaceX could very well bring Ship 37 back to Mega Bay 2 to install additional metallic heat shield tiles in the areas that were left exposed. Right now, they're developing metal tiles made from stainless steel or Inconel alloys to replace the fragile ceramic ones. These metal tiles are stronger, reusable up to 50 times compared to ceramics, and cheaper to produce. Removing some of the ceramic tiles might also be a way to test these new metal tiles on Ship 37, especially in high heat areas. Observers have noted things like white circles on the surface of some ships, which could indicate reinforced zones or material experiments. If these metal tiles prove durable and heat-resistant after Flight 10, they could eventually replace ceramic tiles completely, cutting down post-flight inspections and boosting reusability, key for satellite launch missions. Of course, if Starship is only being used to haul cargo for Moon or Mars bases, such replacements aren't strictly necessary, since the vehicle isn't designed to return to Earth. There's more. Some of the area's missing heat shield tiles could also be where SpaceX plans to test active cooling systems, running supercooled methane or liquid oxygen through channels under the metal tiles to absorb heat during re-entry. Removing the ceramics lets them see how well this system works in real conditions, and how the metal tiles integrate with active cooling under extreme thermal stress. But what if they don't install any more heat shield tiles? Well, that would basically mean Ship 37's fate is already sealed. It's destined to explode somewhere over Boca Chica. Why? Because leaving Earth is nothing compared to the enormous challenges of coming back safely. Astronauts have shared in documentaries that re-entering the atmosphere is the most dangerous thing they've ever done, even with full heat shields. When any object plunges into the atmosphere, it's accelerated by Earth's gravity while also facing extreme drag and friction. This generates massive mechanical stress and heat, which can wear down or even completely destroy the object. Right now, the only way to manage this energy is to slow down gradually through atmospheric friction while carefully controlling the angle of the starship's flaps. This process converts velocity into heat, which is exactly why strong heat shields are absolutely essential. You might wonder, why not just fire the engines in reverse to slow down? The problem is that the forces involved are so immense that the rocket would need far more fuel than it can carry to decelerate effectively. Typically, the engines are only reignited when the spacecraft is close to landing. In short, removing the heat shield tiles was necessary to push the vehicle's limits, identify weak points, or perhaps they plan to add metallic heat shields later. In my opinion, the chances of Ship 37 burning up during this flight are quite high. But if it reaches the ideal altitude and successfully deploys the dummy Starlink, all the data they gather will be well worth it. So, what do you think? Will Ship 37 explode on Flight 10? If you think it will, comment 1. If you want it to survive, comment 10. Thank you. While we wait to see Ship 37's fate, let's also take a look at some hot news from SpaceX's longtime rival, ULA. They just successfully launched multiple U.S. military satellites into high orbit during the primetime launch on Tuesday evening, August 12th, marking a major milestone as their new Vulcan rocket transitions from development to operational status. As you know, being a longtime competitor means every move affects each other's reputation. This mission, named USSF-106, was the first flight of ULA's Vulcan rocket carrying a national security payload. 
Last year's two Vulcan test flights gave military officials enough confidence to authorize it for medium to heavy class national security missions. So, it's not just SpaceX making strides, ULA is also cementing its role as a reliable partner for the Department of Defense. Here's how it went. The rocket flew east from Florida's space coast, cutting through the atmosphere, with four boosters, the core stage, and payload fairing falling into the Atlantic. The upper stage, Centaur, fired its RL-10 engine multiple times to reach a nearly circular geostationary orbit, over 22,000 miles, around 36,000 kilometers from the equator. These maneuvers took about seven hours before Centaur deployed the payload to begin its mission. One of the satellites is a test bed to try next generation technologies that could improve GPS. There's at least one more satellite, possibly more, on board that the Space Force hasn't publicly disclosed. ULA's success is a significant shot across SpaceX's bow. Vulcan has been in development since 2014, just two years before Starship, and they nailed their third mission. Despite a minor issue during the second test flight, ULA fixed it and got certification for national security missions by March 2025. This success opens a new era for ULA in supporting defense space missions and reduces reliance on the Russian RD-180 engines previously used on Atlas V. ULA plans to ramp up Vulcan launches, aiming for nine flights in 2025 and 20 to 25 in 2026. Naturally, this puts extra pressure on SpaceX to push Starship development even further. SpaceX and ULA have been fierce competitors in the past. Back in 2016, SpaceX broke ULA's monopoly by winning an $82.7 million GPS-3 satellite launch contract from the U.S. Air Force, marking the first EELV contract awarded to a non-ULA company in over a decade. By 2025, SpaceX had surpassed ULA as the top launch provider for the U.S. Space Force, securing 28 missions worth $5.9 billion, compared to ULA's 19 missions in a $13.7 billion package covering national security missions through the early 2030s. ULA has faced criticism over performance, especially delays in the Vulcan program, prompting the Air Force to consider shifting some missions to SpaceX. Now, as ULA begins to gain ground again, Elon Musk surely isn't going to sit back. He's ready to beat ULA with the world's most powerful rocket, Starship. So, stay tuned to see what happens next.